What I'd like to do today is to present a compliment to the case for rejoining the EU, starting with some practical political facts about the constraints and opportunities on Britain's EU relations. And looking at it in the midterm, which is after the 2024 British election and election for the European Parliament. The scenarios that I will present are leading scenarios. The important thing is not to argue about what will happen, but to identify one or two most likely alternatives and be ready to jump when the cookie crumbles. What we know is that in the life of the present British Parliament, there is not going to be a significant opportunity for change in British UK, in EU relations, because the current or the next British Prime Minister after Boris Johnson will still be beholden to a large block of determined Brexiter Tory MPs. Downing Street will know this, Brussels will know it, and they will have better things to do than go through the motions of closer relations. Um, the outcome in 2024, the next election, given that the Conservatives are heading for defeat, will be at the last possible moment, which is autumn 2024. And a lot of things can happen between now and then. But the climax of these things that have yet to happen, like Northern Ireland, will be a new parliament. Now, on current circumstances, um, there are three possibilities. First of all, a Labour majority. Second, a hung parliament with the Scottish National Party, the third largest party in parliament, and holding the balance in a hung parliament. Oddly enough, the better the Liberals do, the more likely a Labour majority, because they will take seats from the Tories and help Labour gain seats as well. The third possibility is a Conservative government. That's the least likely. As of uh, January 2022, it's 50-50, whether it's a Labour government or a um, hung parliament. And I think the more important thing and the more likely to strengthen uh, UK-EU EU relations will be a hung parliament. Now, the next thing that will happen in January 25, is there will be a new EU Commission, there will be a new EU Parliament, and there could well be a new American President. Before then, if Biden's health is a problem, or necessarily 6th of January, or thereabouts, 2025, the Speaker of the pro tem of the Senate will have to confirm a new president. I think a reasonable planning motion is that the next president of the United States will have even less interest in UK politics and possibly EU politics. The US negotiation with the Ukraine leaves both Britain as well as the EU on the sidelines. So I'm assuming that there's no 
fundamental change in the activities of the EU, some of which I suspect are viewed rather negatively by people watching my talk. Well, let's assume the EU carries on as it always has. The more controversial or unpopular the behavior the EU is, the more likely it is to mobilize Tories against, and some Labour MPs against the EU. Uh, the less controversial it is, the more it will appear irrelevant. Uh, if Labour wins office, which is the most likely scenario, by winning, I mean winning control of Downing Street where EU policy will be made. It won't be made by Parliament. We saw what happened to Theresa May. Um, it will win on an uncontroversial series of policies. It's time for a change. Let's clean up the mess. Let's talk about symptoms rather than causes. Now, the EU Brexit could well be a cause of symptoms, but it will not be presented in the discourse of uh, labor, certainly, because it still regards the EU as a hot rail, and Rachel Reeves has gone even uh, further in the Guardian and said, we're not going to join. The key thing that Labour will say is that, do you feel better than five years ago? And if the answer is no, then vote Labour. And uh, there will be a Labour Prime Minister who, amongst other things, uh, will start looking at dealing with the problems. Now, the Labour Manifesto, I would predict, um, its EU paragraph or two will be very simple. Whatever you say, say nothing. It will be embedded within rebuilding Labour's trust uh, in the rest of the world, the rest of the world's trust in the UK. Nobody can be against that. There will also be a separate section, which will be relevant, about rebuilding the United Kingdom, protecting the Union, which will also be very vague. And Gordon Brown, which policies will be referred to, but probably not by name given what happened in 2010. Um, there will be things uh, that will be picked up in the prong offensive about rebuilding uh, British business, British industry's ability to compete, and that will include uh, pledges to do things that business wants uh, to make life easier with Europe. This could well be the form of reviewing regulations that impede UK trade. Now, that would be a code word for rejoining uh, trade relations with Europe, saving money by avoiding duplication and unnecessary paperwork. Those are things the meaning of which can be spelled out later. The interesting question is how holiday travelers will adapt and people who live abroad but vote and participate in British politics. COVID has greatly confused this, but we'll just have to see what, come, what the state of holiday insurance is for health people being refused treatment in European hospitals uh, or even dying because they're not covered by 
EU membership, and they don't have the relevant documents. But the key thing will be what Keir Starmer said in The Guardian, that the labor policy is to make things work. Now, the reason for looking at beyond 2024 is to see how the EU comes into this. In a home parliament, which will be novel but clear, um, the key party will be the Scottish National Party, because whatever happens in England, it will have anything from 45 to 100% of the Scottish seats. The Liberals will be committed to the EU in principle, but they will be irrelevant because the best forecast gives them maybe two dozen seats along with a Labour majority. Whereas even in a Tory government, the Nats would come third. And with 50 seats or so, they can put a Labour prime minister in office with Labour having less MPs than the Tories, which is entirely possible if the Tories were able to recover somewhat under a new prime minister. So the question is, what does the Scottish National Party want that's relevant to Europe? First of all, it wants a referendum on Scottish independence call in 26, uh, 26, so that Scotland can join the European Union. Now, the aim of independence for a Scottish audience is independence full stop, let the heavens fall. But a realistic appreciation of the future of Scotland is it shouldn't be outside both England and Europe. So the SNP of necessity will have to promote closer relationships between what might be called North Britain and Europe. And North Britain could include on a good day for the Scottish army of the 14th century, the Red Wall constituencies. Think about that one. <laughs> the key thing is that in a referendum campaign, the SNP will be driven by the unionists to talk about trade with England and trade and saying, we will just replace trade with England with trade with the continent as rubbish. The other thing is, it will not want to be caught in the position and that Northern Ireland is in trade with England. Now, we don't know where the Northern Ireland position will be in 2025, but uh, let us assume it will be better than it is at the moment. And of course, a Labour government uh, with better ties with Dublin and with pro-Republicans um, would not want to prejudice an independent Great Britain and the creation of a united Ireland, which means the destruction of the UK, it would still want to have good ties all around. So that's an area in which um, the, both the SNP when I looked about two years ago, there were people in the Dublin Foreign Office reading Scottish newspapers and they beefed up their consular service in Edinburgh. It's an interesting area. Um, uh, if there is the union wins, and that's an 
end to independence. Um, then the question of reconstructing the UK will come into it and EU will not be relevant. But if it's a yes majority uh, for independence, and the odds are 50-50, and the Tory government, by getting a new leader, is perhaps trying to stop the rot with Scotland that will break off Scotland, but it's still uh, there as a possibility. Then part of the renegotiation of Scottish independence will be negotiating borders with England. And of course, here, a free trade common standards area with England will also have echoes to people who are interested with what happens with the bigger English market on the continent. So that will be very much in play. If, on the other hand, there's a labor majority, then it's a simpler, more controllable, predictable environment, at least on the Westminster side, it seems to me that a realistic strategy which Starmers will make things work is to be pragmatic, look at specific instrumental measures that would strengthen UK-EU relationships and not bother with debating large, vague principles like Britain taking a place in Europe, taking a place in Washington, taking a place in India, and rejoining the world of Tony Blair. <laughs> That's not what English lawyers are about, the protectionists. Um, the key thing, I think, is to emulate the Norwegian elite and learn the lesson. The Norwegian elite held two membership in the EU referendums. They lost them both. What they then decided was to get the best arrangement possible without a third referendum and quick learning would be without a second referendum, because I think it's almost inconceivable that Britain, the, uh, the UK, or an independent England could join the EU without having, get, get EU approved by Parliament without including another referendum. It's certainly the most likely cause, even if the government didn't want it. And it would have to be prepared to have a second referendum, which British prime ministers don't want because it risks a failure or rejection of something they've spent years working on. They'd rather get a piecemeal. I don't say half a loaf, because if you do things piecemeal, you can end up with 53% of the loaf, 78%, 32%. It's a piece, it's a smorgasbord sort of strategy to set out for strengthening EU relationships and the UK. The first thing is, of course, uh, priority would be to remove frictions on the movement of goods and services, uh, including rock bands, which will be popular, um, regulations, which could save money by repealing redundant things and would have business support because it would save business money, and also on the movement of people, which comes back to travel, holiday makers, second homes, and all that, and winning over Tory second homeowners. The second 
in the course of doing this, which would involve a lot of detailed negotiations with Brussels or consultations and our negotiations, consultations if it's repealing UK measures, negotiations if it requires agreements, things in writing from Brussels as well, would be to sound out the possibility of a special situation membership. Brussels has said, remember, that um, um, the UK is too big to be treated like Norway and Switzerland. That means it's treated worse when <laughs> it's got a big liar or a big fraud like Boris Johnson as prime minister. But one could conceive of circumstances, for example, if events in the Ukraine and Washington were to increase pressures for building a European security force, then Brussels could look to Westminster in order to have closer ties. Westminster would be an asset. But um, special situation membership would still have to be put to the, all the EU member states that I would regard as something for after the 2029 election. The realistic alternatives for the next parliament would be a emulating Norway, building ties, beefing up a UK or a British um, EU office in Brussels to do the work that needs to be done by shadowing all the Council of Ministers and the core report meetings when you're not in them, but at least knowing what's there and getting in early about things that are in the mutual interest of ministers and core report members who are there. It's emulate Ireland. It's emulate Portugal. This, quite frankly, has the further attraction of getting the British government to behave like a medium-sized or a smaller state than Liz Trust and Tony Blair think it is. Because clearly, everybody else has seen the British people and the British policy cut itself down to size from Iraq straight through to Brexit. Um, in a sense, a minimum target for 2029, when the 2029 election comes up, is to formalize a special situation non-membership. If the Norwegians and the Swiss can live with it, and perhaps uh, by that time, there will be other reasons for non-membership. For example, if a major member state were to insist that joining the Euro was a condition of becoming a member, that would almost certainly put paid to a discussion of membership. Uh, in number 11 Downing Street, and that would seep over to number 10. Um, all of this is a discussion of bounded rationality. It can be dismissed as too optimistic or we don't know, but at least they are relevant thoughts that accept the political constraints that are currently on the British government, which does not have the free hand it has to negotiate many things because the referendum and Brexit and the continuing, assuming that the Brexit ideologues are keeping Europe on the screen 
in the public eye, the policy of a labor opposition is to keep it out of the public eye when they're on the screen and when they're standing up in Parliament. After all, Boris Johnson makes it dead easy to stand up as leader of the opposition. Um, to hope that the EU will not be strengthened by the departure of the UK, it's possible, and if I were giving this talk on the continent, some wise person in Berlin or Paris might say, well, look, why should we want Britain back when we're able to get on better without it? And to also to hope that there's no crash uh, engineered by Ukraine, the ECB, or Poland and Hungary. So we'll see, but these are thoughts that people listening can carry with them. And if they like, disagree, like putting forward alternative scenarios within the bounds of what's realistic. Thank you.